That's good. Can you hear me? Yes. You know, I'm asking purposefully because you had lunch, so you are not sleeping here. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much, for, uh, Imran and Faisas, for this opportunity uh, to bring me in here. Because with me, it is four million boys coming from Bangladesh and many more millions from other production countries as well. So first, let me introduce the Bangladesh Apparel Industry uh, to you. How many of you know that how big our industry is? I mean, any, any guess? No worries, you are not in a school, okay? N not in a classroom even, okay. So we are the second largest apparel producer in the world, just right after China. It's a tiny country, but we are doing that. So the four million workers are working for industry directly, and we have over 4,000 factories uh, across the country. And these women are young women I'm talking about. Mostly 99% of them are uh, migrated from countryside to the city for this job with a big dream that that will change their life. Because before that, the job they had, they thought it is not respectable because the job they had before coming to the factory was uh, as a housemaid or working in an agriculture field. So they thought being a factory worker, you know, working for those machines and making clothes for a Western country, they will be earn better, they will be live better. But soon as they come to the industry, their dream gets broken. These young women workers who has like average ages 25 to 30 years old, uh, they think that they will be having a economic freedom, they will have a women empowerment, but it is ended up with a low wages jobs, a poverty wages jobs. So industry, a, the apparel industry in Bangladesh is that important, it's a 25 billion worth industry, and 80% of our ex export income coming from this industry. So, other word, this is the backbone of Bangladesh economy. So the workers in this industry, those 4 million, 85% of them are female workers. So just think about 85% of the female workers are working, coming with that big dream. And as I said, that their dream get broken, soon they uh, start working in this industry. And how that, the first, $68, $68 a monthly wages they get. That's the minimum wage. And including over time, that can be like another 10 bucks, but it is not one person a full month cost even in Bangladesh, let alone if she has two kids in her family. She doesn't have any job security, she don't get the the contract with the employer, so the employer get an opportunity to fire her anytime they want. The workers facing enormous gender based violence in these factories. The inappropriate touch is pretty common by the supervisors. Most of the time, she doesn't even know that how to protest to that. There is two reasons not to do that. One, the cultural taboo, the culture you have been taught not to talk about it. Women, if you talk, then you are the bad one. And the second, if she talks, she lose her job and she cannot afford that. So she don't even talk about the gender violence in those factories. So the lack, of, I mean, when I say we're saying all these, don't we do have the law for the protection of these workers? Yes, we do have. We do have pretty good law, but these law are not implemented in these factories. The government and their officials, they really don't monitor. The factories those workers are working, those are not safe. All factories are not safer. The Imran just told you about the Rana Plaza. The Rana Plaza is not only one accident that we ever had in this industry. 
the first accident I can remember that was even 1990. A factory fire killed 29 people, including the factory owner, one of the owner, and the reason was the doors was locked when people was working inside the building. And all I'm telling, it is not a study I have done. It is not that somebody has told me. It is my personal experience. I started working for this industry when I was 12 years old. I went to the factory with my 10 years old brother. And that was not my choice that, oh, just leave the factory and go to the, uh, you know, just leave the school and go to the factory. I had to go because my father was the primary earner and he got ill, so there is no one who can bring food in the table for seven. My mom, she started first, but she had a two, two months old infant at house, which is my younger sister, she was just two months old, so there is no one who can take care of her. So my mom had to stay at home and send us, uh, send two of us to the factory. And the reason was, the mom did not pay it enough, so she couldn't send us to the school and get a nanny to take care of her baby sister. So she had to choose to send us to the factory. And I started working without knowing any law or rights. Only thing I had, the understanding that these factory owners so kind, they gave us job so I can feed my brother and sisters. I would be working over 400 hours in a month and making only $6. Often getting slapped by the supervisors, the, you know, the abuses stood up 12 or 16 hours uh, in, in my feet. That was pretty common. And when I came to law, know law and rights after a few years, it was a four hours long training class, the labor law training class I sat down which completely changed my life. And I consider that's a second born for me. And since then, I mean, in that class, I came to know my workshop's supposed to be eight hours. I should be paid a minimum wage. There should be a high and bathroom for workers. My supervisor should not be slapping me, abuse me. And something beautiful I learned that I have right to organize and right to bargain with my factory owners. And from the following morning, I started sharing these stories, what I learned with my coworkers, and we got organized. But as it has happened, even today in Bangladesh, as soon as I organized union and you know, applied for a registration, I got fired. And lately, I got blacklisted throughout the industry. What I consider, that is a stupid decision ever those factory owners have taken. They shouldn't have fired me. <laughs> no, they shouldn't have done that. I mean, if I would be in the factory, I would be barely organizing like 2,000 workers and leading them. Now, just see what I'm doing, OK? I know they are thinking of their mistake. But when I'm saying all these, is these things has changed in terms of organizing, in terms of safety, in terms of wages? I would say yes and no. The $6, I would consider it, you know, more than the $68 our workers are getting today. Or it would be soon $95 from next year, but it would be still not enough because the inflation and the wage hike never match. The workers still get retaliated, beaten, traded, falsely charged, even forced to leave the community when they try to organize union and join with union that happened to me, that happened today. Throughout this battle, last 29 years, that tells how old I am now. Okay, La yeah, last 29 years, I was in prison. I saw many of my coworkers being in prison and I lost my coworkers too. One of my coworkers has been disappeared and brutally tortured and beaten to death. And who is behind of this? Of course, these manufacturers, of course, this government. We have the government and manufacturers is a one face there. In our parliament, 30% of parliamentary members, they own group of government factory. Just think about it. 
whom I'm fighting with. They have money, they have power, they have police, they have talks, they have everybody to teach me that what I should do. But I never stopped, and I will not. So after Rana Plaza, I should say a little before Rana Plaza, since 2011, we are being asking these companies to take a real decision and a real you know, initiative to make our workers' life, safe, life safer, rather doing all this MSI, code of conduct, you know, corporate social responsibility, which has completely failed to save our workers' life. So, uh, you know, for two years of tremendous campaign, we couldn't able to get more than two brands to sign on this document, which we call a code on Bangladesh Fire and Building Safety. And these two companies, one of them was the PBH, you know, the Calvin Klein and Tommy Hilfiger, who signed before Rana Plaza happened, and Chibo, another company from Germany, they signed before Rana Plaza happened. But all other companies had to wait to kill these 1,138 workers in that death trap building until they take a real initiative to make our factory workers' life safe. So after Rana Plaza happened, there was a deadline has given from all the union, global people, consumers, even the investor and shareholders that, hey, Brandt, you got to take this and you have to sign this. And then we got 100, 220 brand who signed a legally binding document called a code on Bangladesh Fire and Building Safety. First phase was for five years and then second phase was for three years. But since he started working in Bangladesh, never was easy you know, by the Bangladeshi government and Bangladeshi uh, factory owners. They never accepted a code in a way that, yes, this will make a real change. They every day made a lot of problem in, in the ground, and today they are in a campaign that they will wipe out a code from Bangladesh. And I think tomorrow is the last day for a code working in Bangladesh, but still they will be operating uh, from the Amsterdam if there is no miracle happens, that governments comes. Like in the cinema, we see that last minute, you know, everything gets changed. So if we, if we see any miracle, then a code will be still, uh, you know, stay in the country. I'm talking a lot of a about a code and why so. Like up to 2013, if we consider five years, 2008 to 2013, we would be losing over 100 workers in average every year either factory fire or collapses. After a code started working in the country, in 2016, the death toll was zero. That is the change we want. That is what we want from these companies, from these governments, from these manufacturers to do. So when I said that a little change has happened since my working time to today, what is the root cause are? The root cause, there are few. One of them definitely, the rest to the bottom business policy by the brands and retailers. If we look into back, hundred and last 150 years of this apparel industry footstep, where they were or what they have been changed, the only one thing they have been changed, the places. The places they have been changed. They were in New York City, they went, they brought, you know, they went to the, uh, southern state in the US, then they crossed the border, went to Mexico, came into the Europe, now they are in Asia. But if we talk about did they raise the price? No. Did they ensure a living wage for workers? No. Did they ensure a safe workplace for workers? No. Did they respect workers' voice at workplace? No. Did they ever work to have this factory uh, to eliminate the gender-based violence? No, only thing, the places. I cannot demand they will be, you know, next 10 years or 20 years later, they will be in Bangladesh. No, but they will be elsewhere. But this is the time for all of us to work together, make things changes. The thing we want, and I'm campaigning for, the Bangladeshi workers or any production country workers, they are looking for, that is only one thing, a job, with dignity. Thank you.
Kalpona, I have uh, a couple of questions for you. If you could sure. uh, advance the slide, please. Um, on this um, screen here, we've listed out uh, two lists of brands. Yes. And I want you to explain to us these two lists. The first are companies that never signed the first accord. No. Can you tell me why they didn't sign the accord? Because they are so afraid to sign anything called legally binding agreement. So the brands who signed this agreement, they know that if they are not comply with the accord clauses, they will receive the arbitration and we can sue them in their native country court. So essentially they didn't want to take responsibility. Exactly. Other okay. word, yes. And then, so these companies never signed. Walmart, Gap, VF Corporation, they never signed the accord. These are companies, I mean, these are the, some of the biggest companies in the world, in our industry. Then, there's a new accord. Yes. The second accord, mm -hmm. which starts 2018. Right. Why is this list so much longer? Why have so many brands not signed the second accord? Some of them did not surprise me because they have like very small uh, you know, production in the country or some of them maybe just done their production. But some brands really surprised me like Abercrombie and Fitch. These That's brands, the second time we're hearing Abercrombie and Fitch too. Oh, yeah. Very different context. <laughs> Um, so these brand, I mean, they're so popular to the, you know, the children or the youngest in the U.S. But when I heard that second accord, they are not signing. That is really surprised to me. Again, this brand thought that, oh, this is too much. Did they sign the first accord? Yes, they did. So they, you know, enough time has passed. So Rana Plaza is out of everyone's mind. So now they're not signing. Exactly. I mean, it seems that if you are not in focus. If the consumers are not looking after, if the you know the newspaper making another story, so this is the time to clean the hands. Well, yeah. Kalpona, you have put it back into focus. Um, I would love for all of you to take these messages back to your colleagues. I'm sure you know executives at these companies. This is this is unacceptable. Um, after the crisis, that you know, 1,100 more than 1,100 people die. If that's not enough. What is? Exactly. Thank you, Kalpona. Thank you so much. <laughs>